from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, I'm Katie Greifeld in for Jonathan Farrow. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, a still hot labor market, at least in October, and trying to find the Fed's terminal rate all as we count down to the next U.S. inflation report. But we begin first with the big issue, another upside surprise. Hey, this is a pretty strong employment report. This uh, continued really strong labor market data uh, is a little bit of, of old news. It validates what we think we know about this labor market. There's clear divergence going on. We are uh, looking at job, uh, you know, the layoff announcements, they're picking up. You see sort of weakening demand in the ISM surveys. We're going to see these layoffs that we were just witnessing show up. We are going to have a landing. But right now, we're not seeing cracks in the labor market yet. Today's job figure uh, isn't something necessarily the Fed wanted to see. So the Fed is going to have to continue on its path. We could see uh, more rate hikes being priced in, even from what's already there. Joining us now to discuss, we have Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornback, Wells Fargo's Maureen O'Connor, and Ashok Bhatia of Newberger Berman. Great to have you guys with us. Matt, I want to start with you. Relative to what we heard just on Wednesday from Jerome Powell, did this morning's payrolls print move the needle at all? Um, I don't think so, Katie. I, it was certainly a good report, uh, but it also did show that some there is some deceleration happening in the labor market. It may not be as sharp as the Fed would like it to be, but it is moving in the right direction. The three-month average of non-farm payrolls did move lower, and this is consistent with the tightening of monetary policy having a lagged effect. Ashok, weigh in. Did this really change all that much if you were Jerome Powell? I don't think so. You know, Powell summarized, you know, he, he was pretty clear at the end of his press conference, the messages he, he wanted the market to take. And it's the hiking cycle is not done. The Fed isn't even thinking about about easing and inflation is, remains, you know, mission number one. And I think, as Matt said, you know, this was it was a decent payroll number. Um, you know, there's certainly a deceleration in jobs. Wages seem like we're we're losing some of the the, the really up, aggressive upward you know steam there, but you know for the bond market, um, th this next inflation print next week, and then the Fed will get another one um, in December. Those are becoming you know the, the the really important data. As I think you know the market generally recognizes that the employment picture is going to be softening next year. Definitely a lot of top tier data to get through even before we get to the December Fed meeting. But Maureen, when you wrap this all together into your world of high grade debt, how do you position a portfolio around this? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think we've been saying this for a while. We've recognized, um, you know, a, a entry point here in investment grade for quite some time. When you think about where yields have gravitated to since the start of the year, um, you know, we have the index now sitting at 6%. Um, the last time you could get investment grade exposure at 6%, you'd have to go back to the financial crisis, which, you know, you, you'll recall at that time was indeed a credit crisis, and that's not what we are in right now, right? You have uh, yields, uh, treasury yields, benchmark yields that are selling off and spreads that are moving wider, creating this higher yield environment, whereas back in 2008, obviously, the opposite was true. You saw, you know, treasury yields rallying hard and spreads gapping wider. So you have this point where you can pick up exposure to investment grades, specifically at a time when fundamentals are still very much intact, and really the...
generation to, to portfolios. But I think second, and I think one of the really interesting things, and, and you know, it's sort of picking up on one of the things Maureen said, which is in the investment grade market with the, the rise in interest rates and low coupons, you've got a lot of quality investment grade issuers that you know, have long dated bonds at 60, 70, 80 cents on the dollar. So these sort of lower dollar price securities, we're finding them very interesting because they give you some nice portfolio characteristics, you know, as long as you're, you're comfortable with, with the underlying credit. And I think that'll end up being, you know, one of the opportunities. We saw it come out of the, the 2008, 2009 experience, and we suspect that'll be a, an interesting area for, for 2023. Ashok, you said something interesting there. As long as you're comfortable with the underlying credit, and for much of this year, sort of the sell-off that you've seen in the debt market, the corporate credit market, I've heard that it's mostly interest rate-driven right now. It's not necessarily credit concerns. Do you see that shifting anytime soon? Um, not anytime soon. I think, you know, similar to, I think a lot, of, and I think the market really picked up on this. You know, in October, we saw, just as an example, you know, high yield spreads tightened, you know, 80 basis points while investment grade spreads were, were unchanged. So I think the market is recognizing that improvements in some of the below investment grade markets, it's going to be hard to get a really, you know, elevated default story or, or experience over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so I, I think that it, that remains uh, the, the, in place. Where we are being a little bit more cautious is, you know, one of the things that will come out of this is the whole world's going to adjust to higher interest rates. And if you're an issuer where you have floating rate exposure, you're going to feel that adjustment to higher interest expense and lower coverage, you know, sooner than a fixed rate capital structure. So I think that's one area to be a little bit more, more um, careful on as, mm -hmm. as over the next few months develop. But overall, um, not expecting a big default or downgrade experience. Matt, let's have you weigh in here. Where do you fall on the duration debate? So we, we've been more neutral on duration more recently. Um, you know, we, we came into this year not liking duration very much at all in the U.S. and in particular in Europe, where we saw the, the greatest scope for higher yields. And, and more recently, we've moved to a neutral stance. And the way that we're framing it for our investors is that we're entering the, the final stages of the, the bear market in the government bond space. So we are expecting government bond yields to top out this quarter. It may have already happened, of course. Uh, we're also expecting a topping in the value of the U.S. dollar versus other currencies. So we're seeing a topping process play out this quarter, and then 2023 is a new year. A number of ceilings, perhaps, we've already passed them, but we've gotten an embarrassment of riches on the macro fundamental side. I want to go back to Jerome Powell's press conference because there was one exchange in particular that caught my attention. Take a listen. To what degree was there an importance or weight given to a need to signal this possibility now, given all the concerns really around the globe about Fed policy sort of driving ahead uh, and everybody else, you know, dealing with their own stress uh, as a result. I'm pleased that we have moved as fast as we have. I don't think we've over tightened. I think there's very difficult to make a case that that our current level is is too tight, given that inflation still runs well above the federal funds rate. We still think there's a need for ongoing rate increases. And um, uh, we have some ground left to cover here and uh, and and cover it. We will. So to my ears, that sounded like Jerome Powell was basically telling us that the Fed isn't necessarily the world central bank anymore, that they're stepping away from that de facto role. And Matt, I want to hear your thoughts on that. First, if you agree with what I heard, and if so, what does that mean when you're thinking about Europe and other countries' bonds? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, when I hear him say something like that, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. The U.S. economy is a relatively closed economy. Uh, and you can see that very clearly in the strength of our labor markets, the, the strength of the uh, retail sales numbers that are coming out, uh, you know, and, and the level of inflation at the core, right? The core underlying level of inflation in the U.S. economy is, is quite high still. And that's in sharp contrast to what we're seeing happen outside of the United States with a dramatic deceleration in growth in Europe, in China, so I, I think it makes sense. Now, how does that feed into our duration views? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the Fed is going to have to do what it has to do. Um, Europe is in a worse shape, we think. 
And so as we make our way through the winter, generally we would be favoring duration more so in Europe uh, than in the U.S. And so that's how we're thinking about the, the global picture. Matt Hornback, Maureen O'Connor, and Ashok Bhatia, everyone sticking with us. Up next, the auction block, global central bank decisions playing a role with the level of debt issuance. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld, in for Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the auction block where we kick things off in Europe. Global rate decisions keeping a lid on the action. Deutsche Bank tapping the primary market for the first time since posting results, nudging weekly issuance in Europe past 8 billion euros. And over in the U.S., issuers race to get ahead of the Fed's rate decision. Comcast and Amex led the early charge, boosting high-grade debt sales to $11 billion this week. And finally, some signs of life in the high yield market. Ford following Tineco in reigniting the primary market, helped by growing demand from investors in a supply starved market. And sticking with credit, JP Morgan's Bob Michael saying it's the calm before the storm. Take a listen. We're only one third of the way through the pricing of high yield. High yield in recessions, credit spreads don't peak until the middle of the recession. And they peak at around 800 to 1,000 basis points all the time. There's at least another 300 basis points of widening yet to go. The Fed's telling you things are going to get pretty bad. Matt Hornbach, Maureen O'Connor, and Ashok Bhatia are still with us. Maureen, let's start with you. 300 basis points of widening on high yield spreads. Is that your call as well? Yeah, we, we would agree. Uh, we do see some some more material underperformance in high yield as we push later in the cycle. Um, and that's just consistent with what you see with you know stronger recessionary headwinds, no question about it. Um, now, I think you know, what will be interesting is when you watch yields, um, you know, yields might not calibrate that much higher because we're likely looking at a wider spread environment in both investment grade and high yield against a picture of lower treasury yields. Um, but yes, we do believe there's probably another shoe to drop here in high yield markets. There's been, um, as you noted earlier in, in the segment, um, some material compression um, across high yield. Um, the, the, the triple B to double B basis right now is at you know, multi-year tights. Um, all of that, I think, needs to unwind a little bit as we press into the later innings of this, of this tightening cycle. Ashok, another shoe to drop in the high yield market. Would you view that as a buying opportunity? Uh, yes. I mean, I, we are in the camp that it's, it's going to be hard. So that would put, you know, putting high yield spreads out to 750 to 800, you know, to get that 300 of widening. And our view is with the fundamental default picture in high yield, as well as the, the substantial improvement in quality that that market has experienced over the last few years, um, you know, and even longer, We'd be surprised if we see that. And I think, you know, one of the debates that will end up happening is, is you know, the, the severity of a recession as well as how nominal measures of GDP hold up against real measures of GDP. And putting that all together, um, we can see more volatility and widening of spreads, but 300 to us is a little, um, little extreme. I want to stick with the default picture there because you mentioned something interesting, Ashok, that it's pretty contained right now, relatively low, at least relative to past recessions. What would need to be seen for that to really creep up? I think um, the, the issue is how long a recession is. Um, you know, one of the things for, for a lot of bond markets is out of COVID, the great uncertainty about things then led a lot of issuers to term out maturities. So the high yield market has relatively contained or few maturities really coming in 2023 and even 2024. So I think you for to see defaults in sort of the seven, eight percent or higher range, which you know can be where high yield often ends up in recessions, you really need to see a significant slowdown that lasts beyond 12 months to get into some of the bigger maturities that would trigger what would be a likely trigger for default. So length of a recession. Matt, I want to get a little cross-asset here with you because it's been interesting having conversations about credit spreads right now. It almost feels like an in ink blot test for your risk appetite because I talked to some bulls. They say, look at spreads. They're so contained. No signs of real pressure for markets. But then I talked to other people who say, this is worrisome. This shows that, you know, 
credit still needs to crack and that is coming. What's your read when you look at spreads? Well, well I, 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 I'm, I'm not an expert in, in the credit markets to, to be sure, but you know, when I look at global macro markets, which is where I focus, um, I'm, I'm left to conclude that if these markets have lived by the sword or by inflation this year, they're going to die by the sword. And so we have to pay particularly close attention to how far inflation falls next year, if, if at all. You know, presumably, uh, the markets have it right directionally speaking, and markets have inflation coming down quite a bit next year. Uh, and that is with the market pricing uh, a Fed funds peak rate uh, just above 5%. So if that's really all it takes to have inflation come down as quickly as markets are pricing for next year, it's not clear to me that we have to go through a hard landing in the United States, which then may be associated with the types of dramatically wide spread levels that uh, people are talking about these days. So, you know, look, we, we have to pay attention to inflation. We get that report next week. Uh, but if inflation comes down as fast as our economists are suggesting it will, I think the Fed could stick the soft landing, which is ultimately what we all really want to see. I'm sure Jerome Powell would love to hear that, too, that that soft landing not just a pipe dream, but Maureen, we actually have a viewer question uh, writing in. Do you anticipate investment grade primary market supply to be pulled forward given the macro uncertainties? Obviously, supply has been come to, hard to come by, but do you expect to see more supply at 10 years and in the curve just because of the shape? Um, so you're, you're, you're touching on kind of two questions there. Um, the, the one on pull forward, I think, is, is, is pretty critical just in terms of the overall supply picture. So when you think about primary markets the last you know, two years, 18 months to two years, um, you know, coming out of the back half of 2020 and for really the entirety of 2021, you just saw this massive pull forward on our calendar. Why? Because interest rates were at historical lows and companies use that opportunity to refinance debt, to shore up liquidity. And the net effect of that is that they went into 22 with a lot of balance sheet liquidity, no gun to their head on refinancing. You know, 2023 and 2024 towers have been largely addressed at this point. Um, so I think they can afford to be patient for a while longer here, which is why when you look at the construct of supply this year, it's really been dominated by the banks. Mm. Um, the banks are spread funders. They're not fixed rate funders, right? So corporate volume is way down, down about 30 percent. It's been a massive technical for our market. And I think part of what's keeping a lid on, on spreads. Um, what's going to cause another pull forward? Well, honestly, I think it comes against a backdrop of materially lower Treasury yields. Um, it's as simple as that. And unless we get that over the next 12 to 18 months, which, you know, I guess is anybody's guess at this point, um, I think we'll probably be looking at another muted issuance year, with the caveat being that there are some areas like M&A supply, et cetera, that can be catalysts for, um, for issuance next year. But at least from our perspective, we don't expect a material uptick in issuance volumes. It's certainly not between now and the end of the year. Guys, we're going to be right back. Matt Hornback, Maureen O'Connor, and Ashok Bhatia, everyone sticking with us. Still ahead, the final spread. We're going to look at the week ahead with FedSpeak returning ahead of key inflation data. That conversation coming up next. I'm Katie Greifeld in for Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the final spread, looking at the week ahead. Coming up, we have FedSpeak returning with President Collins, Mester, and Barkin all speaking on Monday. Then the U.S. midterm elections underway on Tuesday. We have wholesale inventories on Wednesday, followed by the event of the week, the latest inflation print hitting on Thursday. And finally, we're going to round out everything with the UMICH Consumer Sentiment Report. But now it's time for the rapid fire round. We have three questions, three quick answer. Guys, I'm looking for yes or no answer here. And I'm going to start with Matt. Is the Fed's terminal rate above 5%? No. Ashok? No. Maureen? Right at 5. <laughs> right at 5. Fair enough. Next question. Is U.S. monetary policy already in restrictive territory, Maureen? Yes. Matt? Yes. Ashok? Yes. Okay, final question. Does U.S. CPI surprise to the upside on Thursday, Ashok? Uh, that, boy, that's the hard, that's the, the million dollar question. I'm going to go no on that one. 
Matt. I'll go no as well. Maureen. I'm going to hope for no. <laughs> All right, we've got a lot of consensus here. We're going to leave it here on that happy note. Matt Hornbach, Maureen O'Connor, and Ashok Bhatia, thank you all so much for your time. And as we look ahead to the week, of course, all the attention is on that inflation print. If you look at what is expected for U.S. CPI on a year-over-year -year basis, consensus sits at 7.9%. Remember, the prior figure was 8.2%. So whether we actually get below that 8% handle remains to be seen. Of course, we're going to keep an eye on all of that over the coming week ahead of the midterms, too. A lot to keep an eye on. But from New York, that's going to do it for Bloomberg Real Yield. Same time, same place next week. This is Bloomberg.